This is the slider from the Stripe Sessions 2023 website that broke the internet for a couple days. One year later, I've decided to give it a go and make it myself. So you can see here we have our little fighter characters and we can select them and we're getting that nice hover effect. And when we choose one of these very ends here, it pulls from the right and gets over. And then if we choose from the left here, it goes to a previous slide. And this is all built with the Webflow CMS with a little bit of GSAP. So let's get started. Hey there, Web Bay. The layout is accomplished with a flex box with two CMS collections. We have the text CMS collection on the left and the images CMS collection on the right. And all that we're having in there is one image and then also an H2 and a paragraph right there. So what we have with the text is that on the sessions text item here, we're setting this to position absolute just so that everything layers on top of itself. And we're gonna control the opacity of each individual slide such that only one shows that is selected. Now, the way that we're gonna know it's selected is by using data attributes. And those data attributes live over in settings here. We're going to apply a custom attribute called data slug, and we're going to use that slug from the CMS collection of our fighters. So that's on there. Now we need to link it up to the images CMS slider. So if I come over here to the sessions slide, then we're going to see if I come down on the settings that I have the exact same custom attribute here, data slug equals to slug. And you'll see in the code how we're using this to make the text on the left sync with the images on the right. Let's inspect the sessions list here on our images slider. And we'll see that this is just a horizontal flex box with overflow set to hidden. And then if we inspect each individual slide, we'll see we have margin on the left and right. And the flex child sizing is set to be a grow and shrink of one. So that lets it grow or shrink and then a basis of 10%. I've also applied a height of 20 rem just to make sure that this slide has some height. Now sessions image has a height of 100% and is set with an object fit of cover so that it fills up that entire height. And we can see that since it fills up that entire height, it's wider than the actual flex basis of 10%. But as we hover, it will still maintain that cover. Now there's a lot of important styles up here in this HTML embed where I'm writing a lot of custom CSS. Now I'll walk through this custom CSS really quick and then we'll hop over to the JavaScript. So we can see that both session slide and all of its children by the second selector here, have transition all applied to them. You could improve performance by putting the actual properties in here like transform and opacity, but all seems to be working great for now. So let's leave it at that. We're gonna be using a data active attribute on our session slide to know which slide the user has selected. And that's gonna be controlled by JavaScript, but we wanna style it such that, that flex basis goes into a variable that we're storing called sessions width and gets flex grow of zero. So if I actually save this and come over to variables, we can see that our session's width is set to an explicit value of 300 pixels. Back in our custom CSS, we can see we have desktop styles here using this uh, screen media query of min width of 768 pixels. And then down to our mobile here, we have the mobile media query. And once you understand desktop, then you'll go ahead and understand mobile. The main thing is that we're gonna show fewer slides on mobile because we just can't fill the space with what we have here, which is eight slides being shown at once on desktop. A lot of the nice animation is controlled by using CSS selectors on the nth child. So you'll see here that we do have our hover for when we hover over something, we're going to set the flex basis to be that sessions width divided by two, so 150 pixels. And then we've also set the transition here to be 0.3 seconds for that hover effect. Now we get into all those nth child things that I was talking about, so let's go. These are all commented so that we know what each one does. This is for the first and last slides. So this third one is actually the first one that we see. So it is this one over here. And we can see we're just setting that flex to be a bit smaller, whereas before it was 10%. Now we're hard coding it to 10 pixels, so we get this thin one over here. The nth child two is actually set to flex five pixels with a transform of negative 50 pixels. We actually don't see it now because it's translated out of the list, which has overflow hidden applied to it. Now, when our code appends a new slide to the left here, this second slide is actually going to become the third slide and it's going to lose these styling elements and then gain this one. So we're gonna see it grow from five pixels to 10 pixels, as well as that translation will get removed. So it's going to come into view and we're going to be able to see it. Now the 11th slide, this is the end slide stage outside of the list view that will animate in from previous slide. So it's just doing the exact opposite of what's going on up here. Now we also want to take care of our invisible first and last slides at the end. So we have our nth child of one here. So that's that first one. We're setting it to have zero width 
zero margin and zero opacity. So it doesn't really affect anything within our list. And with N plus 12 here, that means the 12th slide and beyond. So the last slides, and there are 12 items in our CMS here. It works with 11 or more. So if you're thinking about using fewer items in your CMS for this slider, you'll need to adjust these nth child CSS selectors as well as the JavaScript code. The last selectors in the desktop media query here are for not the nth child of the fifth and beyond. So this is going to target slides one through four, and then we're gonna get the image inside that. And then we have the ninth slide here and beyond, we're getting the image in there, and we're just reducing that opacity such that the opacity of these images on the edge is reduced. So if I set this to point two and save, you'll see that they become a lot more opaque, just like that. So I'm gonna reset this to point eight and save that. And then down here, we have our mobile media query, which is doing the same thing with nth child, but we're gonna look at five items instead of eight. So we can see if I come down to the mobile viewpoint here, now these end slides here are two and eight in our list rather than what was it, three and 10. I also remove the hover effect on mobile because it doesn't make sense to have a hover effect on mobile, right? The last thing to cover in our Webflow project is that I am serving the code via VS Code on a live server extension. And you can see here, I have the script tag inside our page settings. So we're deferring the script so that it launches after the DOM content loaded. It's a module type and we're setting the source, which is just our local computer. When you find this clonable posted, I'll have all the code actually in the closing body tag down here. So here's a skeleton of our JavaScript module. And now I'm gonna start by importing the GSAP object from Skypack's CDN. Because this is a module, I can use this sort of import syntax. All right, if your palms are sweaty when I say the word JavaScript module, then don't worry, I got you covered in my Patreon. So head on over to Patreon in the collections tab here. I have a JavaScript in Webflow course teaching you all the JavaScript basics using Webflow projects. And if you come down to the, I think it's the fifth chapter, no, the sixth chapter, which is actually the seventh because I have a zero with because we start counting at zero when we're coding. We have the module section here where I go into all sorts of examples and a full Webflow project on exactly what modules are, JavaScript ESM modules. It's a great way to make your code modular and expand your code bases and expand your JavaScript knowledge. Now up here, we'll just define our selectors, which are the class names of the elements that we want to select on the page. We wanna be able to select the list, the slide, and the text items. So we can actually query selector these right here. We're getting the list here and we're getting all of the text items with query selector all here and storing them in text. And if we don't get the list, we'll just throw an error that no slides are found. Now let's start by setting the opacity of all the text items to be zero such that they're all invisible and we don't see them. And then we'll initialize one of the texts, actually the fourth one, because that's gonna be our very first looking slide, but we'll see that later. Now the rest of the skeleton here, we have get active index, get slide index, previous slide, next slide, choose slide, activate slide, activate text, and handle slide click. And we know for sure that on our list, we want to add an event listener that when we click anything on it, we handle the slide click. And now all handle slide click will do is call choose slide, getting that event that is passed um, in here. So let's go ahead and start up here at get active index and get slide index. These are helpers that are going to help us track where we are and which slide is active. So for get active index, we're just going to query selector that data attribute data active that I mentioned before. If that doesn't exist, we'll return null. Otherwise we'll return the slide index of that active slide. And we're gonna write that down here. So what we wanna do here is we want to use document.querySelector all on our slide selector. Again, that's up here. We're gonna create an array from that with array.from and then we're gonna grab the index of that element in the array and we get the slide here. And now something that's important to note is that we're gonna be shifting the order of our list as user clicks and navigates through our slider. So we're gonna remove items off the front or off the back and then append them to the front. That's called prepending or append them to the back. So what's important of that is that the order of slides in our slider is going to be dynamically changing. And so we need to query selector all of our slides pretty often inside all of these functions, we can't just reuse our list up here or select all the slides up here and go off that. Now, previous slide, this is the function that gets executed when we select this slide over here. And so we see pushing over to the right, we're gonna make that one the active slide and just kind of shove everything over that way. So what we'll do here is we'll go ahead and get that active index. We'll have a little bit of error checking here. And then we will query selector all of our slides. We'll get that last slide. So slides.length minus one, and we'll call that on our slides array or node list right here. And then we'll call it last.remove. So we're removing that element off at the end. 
and we will prepend or insert at the front that last slide. Then we're going to call our activate slide function and we're going to pass that active slide, which is slides of index. We will write our activate slide function down here in just a moment. But next, let's handle the next slide case. This is going to be very similar to previous slide, but we're going to remove the first one and append it to the end. So we'll get the active index again. We'll do some error checking. We'll get a reference to all of our slides. We'll grab the zero with slide and then we will remove it and then we will append it and we'll call activate slide on slides of index. So again, that is when we're calling the next slide here, we're getting this motion that's going on. Choose slide here is a very important function. It's gonna help us append that data active attribute as well as discover or figure out which actual slides are the important ones. So in this case, you know, it's this slide here, we have to do the previous or next slide. But then if we click on the middle, things, nothing like fancy happens. We're just changing the active slide and making sure that it becomes and displays as the active slide, just like that. First, we'll do our little bit of error checking, which is just making sure that our target is an instance of an HTML element. If it's not, then we definitely run into some problems. So we'll just return and escape from the function. Otherwise, what we wanna do is get our max. And our max is basically that last slide is which is the one that we need to click to make something happen over here and push our elements. In the case of desktop, it's eight. And in the case of mobile, it is five. Again, because there's two elements over here that we're not actually seeing. So we're calling the match media function on our window and checking if our screen is 767 pixels or not. If it is, then we want it to be five and we know we're in the mobile case. Otherwise we want it to be eight and we know we're in desktop. So what we're going to do now is get the closest slide to the thing that was clicked. So here we have e.target and then dot closest and pass our slide selector there. And if we don't get a slide, then we just return. Hopefully we do, really we should. We'll do some error checking. If we don't get a slide, we will escape the function. Otherwise we'll get the slide index of our slide. So remember we already wrote this, store that in a variable called index. And then we'll check on the index. If it's less than three or greater than max, we return again, clicking over here, it doesn't do anything and clicking before doesn't do anything. So those indexes don't really make sense. If the index is our maxed one, then we wanna call our next slide function, which we wrote up here. Otherwise, if it's equal to three, then we call previous slide. Three is the same case in mobile and in desktop. And then we'll call activate slide on our slide. And then we'll also call activate text passing in the slide as a parameter as well, because we're gonna grab that data attribute from the slug and make sure to get the text that matches that slug. For activate slide, we'll do a, some error checking right off the bat. We'll query selector all of the slides. Again, remember the order shuffled, so let's select them again, store that in slides. We'll remove the data active attribute from all the slides, and then we'll apply it to the right one, which is the slide that we passed in this parameter here. And so we're setting data active to true here. Next, we'll call slide.focus just so that it focuses in on that slide. For activate text, we'll go ahead and grab that slug by using the get attribute method that exists on slide, which is an HTML element, and we'll pass the name of the attribute, which is data slug. Now we'll create an array from our text's node list. Remember that's all the way up here where we use document.querySelector all. This is not changing in order, so it doesn't matter. We don't need to reselect it again. We can just use the one we already have and we'll call dot find. And what we wanna find is an element that has the matching attribute. So we'll get the data attribute on the text element this time. And if it equals slug, which we stored up here, then that will be stored in active text. If there's nothing, then we return, just some error checking. Otherwise, we'll do a quick animation with GSAT where we animate everything to an opacity of zero or all the texts. When I say everything, that's what I mean. And we'll take the active text and animate it to an opacity of one. The very last thing we wanna do is initialize one slide to be active when the page loads. So we'll do that down here for initialization. We'll go ahead and get all of our slides with query selector all. If that doesn't return anything, we'll throw an error. Otherwise, we activate the fourth slide and we activate the fourth text. So this should be everything now. If we save and refresh, we can see we have a working slider just like this. So now our next is working and our reverse is working. And let's go ahead and have a look at what this would be like on smaller screen sizes. So I've just flipped the flex box here to be vertical now. And when you touch it, it's going to flip over to these active slides. We can see if we select one of these that yes, this one has data active true and we see data active true get moved to the next one. And we can see items being removed from the front when I click next slide and being appended down here. All right, well, that was kind of cool. But if you're not sure a slider is the right format for your images, maybe check out this connected grid gallery that I built with GSAP. You can check it out by clicking on the video that I'm gonna pop up right now and I will see you in the next one.